Most of them rake it up and put it in bags. They bag it? Why? Is it a crash cash crop? Do they sell it? No, sir. Just the opposite. They pay to throw it away. Now, let me get this straight. They fertilize grass so it'll grow. And when it does grow, they cut it off and pay to throw it away? Yes, sir. These suburbanites must be really relieved in the summer when we cut back on the rain and turn up the heat. That surely slows the growth and saves them a lot of work. You aren't going to believe this, Lord. When the grass stops growing so fast, they drag out hoses and pay more money to water it so they can continue to mow it and pay to get rid of it. What nonsense. At least they kept some of the trees. That was a sheer stroke of genius, if I do say so myself. The trees grow leaves in the spring and provide beauty and shade in the summer. In the autumn, they fall to the ground and form a natural blanket to keep moisture in the soil and protect the trees and bushes. Plus, as they rot, the leaves form a compost to enhance the soil. It's a natural circle of life. You'd better sit down, Lord. The suburbanites have drawn a new circle. As soon as the leaves fall, they rake them into great piles and pay to have them hauled away. Now, what do they do to protect the shrubs and tree roots in the winter to keep the soil moist and loose? After throwing away the leaves, they go out and buy something which they call mulch. They haul it from they haul it home and spread it around the place of leaves. And where do they get this mulch? They cut down trees and grind them up to make the mulch. Enough. I don't think I can take this anymore. St. Catherine, you're in charge of the arts. What movie do you have scheduled for us tonight? Dumb and Dumber, Lord. It's a real stupid movie. Never mind. I think I just heard the whole story from St. Francis. <laughs> so... Uh, a, a typical suburban lawn is basically a food desert for the birds and insects. Um, there was research done to quantify the, the number of bugs that, that different trees support, and, and then by that, the number of other species that are supported. And uh, oak trees came out very near the top at something like uh, 600 different species being supported. And then there's things like the ginkgo that is down at the bottom. It, ginkgo was, uh, it went through a, a genetic bottleneck, and there isn't anything that eats it. So there, there's that range of, of species that, that are supported and, and, and amplifies, you know, because there's bugs, now there's birds to eat them, and on and on. Uh, basic uh, plant biology here. The roots absorb moisture. And the leaves absorb carbon dioxide. They use the energy of the sun to produce the sugars and starches that they need. And as a byproduct, the oxygen comes out. So they remove and filter air pollution. City trees are one of the most cost-effective methods of curbing urban air pollution. Now, all this, this whole presentation, there's tons of research. I got three file cabinets at home. There's lots on the computer. Uh, and I've, re I've removed all of it. So if you ever challenge me on it, I guess I'll back it up. I've just left you with the, the, the bottom line messages here. So um, saves 850 lives per year and 6.8 billion dollars in healthcare costs in the U.S. He who he, he hews him down cedars and takes the cypress and the oak, which is which he strengthens for himself among the trees of the forest. Isaiah 44, 14. And some more fun trees to look at. Social benefits. We're moving on to the next category. They are often huge disparities between a leafy privileged area and the barren underprivileged areas in an urban in a city. Um, living in green neighborhoods reduces stress. The urban green space improves pride of place. It can actually reduce crime. You've got visual screening, noise buffer, healing and wellness. I'm going to cover a little more. And uh, even decreased asthma and obesity. Uh, some of this gets into, you know, is it correlation or causation? You know, a, a wealthy neighborhood has big tree-filled yards, and a, a poor neighborhood has apartment buildings, and, and there's... It may not be that trees are the cause. There are correlation that, that wealthier people are happier. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I don't think it is. We have to. There's further research to be done on some of that. Having trees and greenery visible out of a hospital window. This is actually old research. Okay. Uh, if, if you're looking at a, a brick wall or a parking lot out of your hospital, 
window, it's going to take you longer to heal than if you're looking at screen growing stuff. Now, at the cost of being in a hospital, five or $10,000 a day, doesn't that warrant having green space around hospitals? Alzheimer's disease and dementia, 10% reduction in amount of medications used if they have uh, horticulture therapy and water gardens available. 30% fewer falls. And then there's something in Japan that's been around a long time called uh, forest bathing. They, uh, they have uh, organized programs and facilities, and they, the employers will, will purposely send their employees out to, to be exposed to the, the nature and get revitalized in order to be better workers. 52 different dedicated bases for forest bathing in Japan. Healing gardens. Um, so besides uh, mature people, it, now again, it's just the, some of the science. Um, you know, the canopy. So, so relating, it's, it's a, some of the approach of, of social sciences combined with natural resource management, uh, how to layer things and, and compare and measure. Um, so shade trees for kids. So another benefit is uh, avoiding skin cancer. That's a good thing, right? And how many playgrounds are out in the hot sun instead of under the shade of a tree? Um, the nature deficit disorder, the, the, the uh, door prize for tonight, Last Child in the Woods, was uh, one of the seminal uh, documents from a couple years ago that kind of woke everybody up about this. Nature deficit disorder, I think, was coined by this author, that, that kids are not getting out in nature enough. And it's affecting their mental health and their, even their immune systems and such. So exercise, balance, and coordination with the help of a tree. Uh, the, the numbers here, um, so of, of a big survey of you know, thousands of parents, only 2% had ever, the parents who allowed their kids to climb trees, only 2% had ever broken a bone because of climbing trees. And then if you look at the, uh, the sports, 3.5 million American children under the age of 14 received medical treatment for Injuries from organized sports every year. But you wouldn't say that the, the, the risk outweighs the benefit there, so why are trees being singled out and disparaged? Do uh, you want a, a, a playground at your school that looks like the, the top left or the bottom left? You know, kids need to get out and get dirty once in a while. Uh, the, the, it, the, there's a study on the microbiomes. If you're not exposed as a little baby to some of this stuff, then your immune system never gets strengthened. So eat dirt in moderation. All things in moderation, right? <laughs> so David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, Do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees. Now this is one where I... Uh, Depending on the translation, it had balsam, it had poplar, it had uh, like two or three different species listed. So I'm curious about if, if, like, you know, which translation is the authority on, on uh, tree species translation. So economic benefits. Money does grow on trees. Obvious one is lumber, building materials, fruits and nuts, increasing property values. There's a whole other talk I could do on appraisal, uh, which I... I'm not, but um, so real estate, you go to sell your house and you've got mature, growing, healthy trees there. On average, it can be 15 to 20 percent uh, premium on a similar house without the trees. You know, proven by lots of statistics and real estate agents. They provide natural air conditioning and energy savings. So the thing is, if you think about the sun, okay, we're facing, let's say that south, I think it is. Um, in the wintertime, the sun is, is coming up low, and, and, and the highest it gets is, is about you know, 45 degrees, and it goes down again. Days are short. And so you don't necessarily want a, a, a big evergreen tree keeping you from gaining that solar energy. Uh, you want to have it open at that level. But then in the summertime, the sun comes up over here. It goes right overhead, and it goes down over there. So, so the mature, deciduous trees that can block a lot of that summer sun so you want them on the east and west of your house, but not directly south, so that you can shade in the summer but gain the solar energy in the winter. 
And then the, the winter winds coming out of the northwest over in this corner is where you put your evergreen windbreak. And uh, they can keep the winter winds away. Uh, business districts, the increased sales, desirability, and rents, shopping time is extended. Just because of trees in a shopping area, people are going to want to spend more time there than somewhere that doesn't have trees. Now, uh, I used to work with a forest consulting company locally that uh, every year we'd get a couple of calls. Of, oh, I've got a big black walnut in my yard. You want to come and you know, give me $10,000 for it? And we'd have to say, gee, no, sorry, uh, because uh, it, it is a single tree, first of all, the volume's not there. Because you need accessibility, uh, you've got to be able to get a big piece of wood to the mill. And most often in urban settings, that's not the case. You've got to cut it into pieces to get it out of there. Um, and, and then the, the, the quality and the species. So too often urban wood has metal in it. You've got old fence lines and, and hammered in uh, bird feeder hooks and whatever. Uh, it's, it's a pretty big risk for, for the mills. And then just the size that needs to be a minimum of about 12 inch diameter and, and 8 to 10 feet long log to, to be anything a, a mill would be interested in. There are some band saws that are portable. A guy can pull it around behind their truck, show up at your site, and, and band saw a, a single tree into lumber uh, for a modest cost. So it, it is feasible that if you really wanted to make lumber out of your own tree, uh, at, at a minimal cost, you can have it happen, but it's not going to pay for the removal by any means. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shita tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine, and the box tree together. Isaiah 41.19. There are also some symbolic intangible benefits. Uh, if, if we uh, are planting trees that we aren't going to benefit from them ourselves. We are giving a gift to the next generation. Leave it at that. So there are problems with trees. Uh, the, the bottom left is a little diagram of tree roots getting into a sewer line. Now, they, they, there are oftentimes plugged sewer lines. They open them up, they find tree roots, and they blame the tree. But a tree root, think about it, it's, it's, a, it's a soft little plant tissue, and it does not penetrate an impervious surface. It, it isn't going to break into the, a pipe or a, a brick wall. It's only following a nutrient stream. So if the pipe is broken and leaking all these nutrients, of course the tree root's going to find it and get in and then occupy that space and, and take advantage of all those nutrients. But don't blame the tree roots. It was a broken pipe in the first place. I even wrote a letter to NSP once when they sent out a brochure about it. Change the language. Uh, oops, I didn't finish. Um, electric lines, you know, the, the middle one in the top. You know, we, need, we all like electricity. We all like having uh, air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter and lights and everything else. Power lines have to be kept separate from trees. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a constant conflict, and it's a big expense that, that power companies spend on trimming trees. If you want to have them, don't plant them underneath the power lines. Uh, root rots are, and, and decays are a, one of the diseases uh, and issues that we don't have a lot of tools to try and fix. So uh, uh, when trees start decaying out from the inside, it isn't necessarily a death sentence. Uh, if you think about it, the strength of a, of a pipe, and it's all in the outer circumference, in the, in the outer column, and it can be hollow and still pretty strong. You need a certain amount of, of thickness there, and if it gets too skinny, it can collapse. But uh, so a hollow tree isn't necessarily a, a, a hazard, but the root rot can be. That's where you know the, the roots are, are eaten away, and it's invisible, and you've got a, a massive tree. It's like a 300-pound guy up here on his tippy toes, and you just have to push him over. And trees do uh, break off and fall on houses and things. But in each of these, uh, uh, so the thing on the right is, is a little diagram of, uh, again, uh, uh, supporting all this biodiversity. As a tree is declining, it's really attractive to all these other bugs. Besides the primary attackers, there's the secondaries and then other things that feed them and all the mushrooms and things that are, are edible. There, there's a ton of things that benefit from a big tree declining. 
So that's not an accident that the power line has a big bare space underneath it. It takes a big investment in uh, manpower and machinery and herbicides and whatever to keep the trees away from the power lines. Because if you don't, that happens. The power will ground out through the tree. And uh, unfortunately, just last year, the Paradise Fire in California killed 80 people and $4 billion and PG&E is going bankrupt, has been blamed on power lines coming in contact with trees. The tree's measure of success is a little different from our own. It's it survived, it's, it's reproducing, it's bearing fruit and, and seeds, and uh, it's putting on new leaves every year. But you can see right through the, the trunk on that thing. It could collapse uh, with a little push. It's, you wouldn't want that growing over your house. So just, you know, tree's standards of success might be different from people's. For you shall be as an oak whose leaf fades and as a garden that has no water. Isaiah 130. These are Hakarandas. One of them is Antigua, I believe. That's a, a tropical tree that, uh, Antigua, Guatemala, sorry. And uh, I don't think the other one is, but uh, incredible when they're all in flower like that. So opportunities or the tree care. So uh, tree ID, I've got a whole other PowerPoint on it, switch to later. We've got the selection and planting. So you need to look at the site, first of all. Uh, what's going to fit there? Look up. You know, too often people aren't looking up when they plant their tree under a power line. Move it over 20 feet. It'll have uh, enough time to grow and be a mature tree. And you put it in the wrong place, and they're going to chop it off. The soil types, the amount of water it's going to get, the amount of sun it's going to get. Uh, the, the, you, can, you can choose. You can start looking at the... Uh, Plant catalogs, and, and you, you want one that's round or pyramid or uh, you know, a, a light trellisy type of shade. Uh, what colors do you want? You want it to flower? You want fruit off it? All, there's all the choices that you have to think about. Um, and then when you're planting it, the options of what what size to get. So bare root is uh, usually up to about you know six eight foot trees. You can still do bare root. A, a dry root's a dead root, so if you're getting a bare root, keep them moist and, and dormant until you actually get it back to ground. And then there's potted ones, and then there's B and B is what stands for bald and burlapped, and that gets into the bigger stuff. You can handle uh, up to maybe 10, 15 foot trees, but now you've got a, a soil ball that weighs a couple hundred pounds, and you need machinery to move it. And then spades are a machine that uh, oh, I should have thrown a picture in one. It's uh, mounted on a big truck. And they've got it's kind of like giant shovels that, that all scoop in around the root ball of a tree and then pick it up and move it to wherever and put it back in. They have to dig the whole other hole first with the same machine. So you have an empty hole, and you go get the tree, and it picks it up and puts it in that hole. And they can move up to maybe yeah, you know, 10, 12-inch diameter trees, although it's hard on them. Again, considering biodiversity and host value, what do you want out of your tree? Um, so that's just an example of a catalog. You go on a, a Bailey's or Bachman's website, and you've got filters you can pick, you know, all the different parameters to pick out your tree, what colors and sizes. Pruning young trees is, is really important. I'm not going to do much more than this. Uh, it's, it's establishing the structure and the scaffold, and, and it doesn't happen often enough that young trees can be shaped up so that they're a valuable tree in the future. If you have what's called co-dominant stems, so you have two leaders, and then as those two leaders both grow in diameter, you've got outside surfaces that can't stitch together. And it gets up to be where you, you think it's going to be a nice tree, and the wind comes the wrong way, and, and half it rips out. That could have easily been corrected when a, it was a young tree if you established the strong central leader with the scaffold branches coming off it. There, there's some simple corrections when they're young that, that make a big difference in the value of a tree later on. And where you plant it, what, what too often happens in uh, new urban, suburban developments, they, they bring in the bulldozers, well, they cut down all the trees, first of all, and they, they bulldoze off the topsoil and stockpile that. And then they build houses. So you've got machinery driving around in the mud, compacting everything, they're bringing gravel, they dump their cement trucks out, they wash it out. All this stuff happens as the building is going up. And then they resell the topsoil that they stockpiled back in, they put a couple inches on it. So you've got a thin layer of decent soil on what's crummy, compacted soil. 
and the trees that they plant can then do this. Uh, it, it's only got access to decent soil in the top few inches, and that's what it uses. And then one day a wind comes along and uh, lifts up the carpet, and it hasn't even gone in the ground. <laughs> and he took of the seed of the land, and he planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters. He set it as a willow tree. Ezekiel 17.5. Some of the pathogens or threats. We have insects. In the category of insects, you've got some that are dangerous and some that are not. You've got a lot of foliage feeders, little bugs that are going to be a nuisance. They might drop on you or you see one and you go, oh, ick. But it's really of, of inconsequential to the tree. They, they've got plenty of reserves. They can handle their leaves being stripped off and they put out more leaves. And as long as they can, it isn't chronic and repeated, uh, they're, they're okay. And you've got boring insects that, that maybe uh, nibble off the, the tips of the twigs. There, there's one twig girdler on the oaks, um, and I've, I've gotten calls to, you know, what's wrong with my tree? It's losing its, it, it, all these little twig, little tufts of, uh, you know, five to ten leaves, and, and they're all over the yard. And it turns out it was either you know, the twig girdler, the little borers, or squirrels. <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, the, the tree can handle it. They're, they're fine. I like those kind of consoles. You can say, yep. Your tree's not dying. And then they can be a vector, though. They, they carry other funguses and viruses. So the Dutch elm disease that wiped out all our big, beautiful elms was a little bark beetle carrying a fungus, and the fungus is what killed the tree. Uh, oak wilt's the same kind of thing. It's a beetle carries a, a fungus. So they, they are dangerous. Uh, and then there's the, so the, the, the fungus, and that's another disease category. You've got decays, root rots we talked about. And then some of the bacterias, uh, elms that are still around, will often have a white streak going down the side, and that's a bacterial wetwood. So again, it's harmless enough to the tree, but in a hot summer day when it's oozing and smelly, it, it looks nasty. Uh, it's, it's living on the dead wood inside. And then, of course, storms, uh, storm wind damage, climate change, other threats out there. And as a representative example of one of the worst threats right now, it's this emerald ash borer. Uh, that's, that's a nice big picture of it. It's actually only about the size of your thumbnail. And so the, the top left is the, the emerald ash borer, and, it, and all the other green bugs are not the emerald ash borer. So that, that was a really hand, helpful handout I would bring to people when I get calls. I think I've got emerald ash borer because it made the news. And you get, uh, which one is it? Oh, no, it's that one over there. All the lookalikes. And Japanese beetle is on there, and that's one of those, a, a big nuisance. The, the cicada the, to the right is a one that in, in Guatemala, little kids will capture the cicadas, tie a thread on it, and fly them around like a kite. <laughs> and it's actually not the adult beetle, but the larva, the, the, the worm uh, life stage, that is the problem. So. It, they, they, they eat the cambium layer. Just under the bark of a tree is, is where all the nutrients flow, and that's the rich nutrients that the, these, this larva is, is feeding on and eating. So the, uh, uh, where the map is of Ramsey County approximately, and those are all confirmed trees. And then the red spot in the middle is us, this church, and there's, a, the, 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 again, a street heading off to the southeast from here is where all those uh, trees have been identified and I, I assume gone by now. So that's Earl and Minnehaha and where the emerald ash borer has been identified in the neighborhood. It's, it's going to take out all the ash trees. I've been to Ohio and other places where it's worse. It's been there longer. And the only ash trees living are ones that are being injected with an insecticide. So the urban forest managers, your city foresters, are preparing for that by doing preemptive removals uh, it's it's kind of like a preemptive war. Is it really a good idea or not? Um, if, if you if all your trees die at once and the street trees, you, you have to take them down. It becomes like a snowstorm. You don't have a choice in the budget. Uh, they're, they're too brittle. They're too dangerous. It's a safety issue, and it'll break the budget. So they're preemptively moving removing them along with street projects and things. Uh, it's the time to do it. And 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 unfortunately, we didn't learn our lesson after Dutch elm disease came through and wiped out all the elms in the 70s. They planted way too many ash trees. So we have population of 30, 40% of our street trees are, are ash, and it's all one species. 
Uh, diversity is one more uh, uh, you know, resilience to, to whatever next bug comes along. So when your ash tree dies, don't plant a maple. There's too many maples being planted right now. I will pour out my spirit in your descendants and my blessing on your children. They will have like water grass, the, like willows on a riverbank. We all know that willow trees like water and uh, the more they have available, the bigger they grow. So, that is the end of that one. Um, we've got some yard tree suggestions. So, uh, if you are thinking about plant trees, we've got black oak. Now, this is a list from Iowa, so it's only a little further south of us, which is, with climate change, probably a good thing. So. There are only one or two in this list that I, I haven't seen a lot of in Minnesota already, so they are all here. Uh, the bur oak, chinkapin oak, northern pin oak, northern red oak, scarlet oak, shingle oak, schumard oak, white oak, river birch, bitternut hickory, shagbark hickory, hackberry, ginkgo, Kentucky coffee tree, which does not make coffee, it's misnamed. Um, sweet gum or liquid amber. Oops. What happened there? Huh. Uh, jump to the end. Let me get it. That's weird. Uh, okay. Uh, um, oh, we're jumping to this one already. Am I not going backwards on that? Yeah, jump to the end. Well, okay, there. Okay, oaks. We got uh, the hackberry. We got sweet gums. Um, huh. Okay, well, look, jump it on. Uh, so now specific tree species. I'll just blow through these real quick. Uh, Amur, Machia. Again, these are all ones you will find in Minnesota. Soda, and they're all options. They're all decent trees, uh, depending. I'd stay away from ash. Um, black, green, there's black walnuts. Uh, that's what's outside the, the front door over here. Is a, it's a black walnut tree. In the fall, we get the, the big green nuts. And Other than that time of year, it's a nice tree. <laughs> they, they can stain sidewalks and things. Poplars, we've got uh, the big tooth or the quaking aspens. And you can tell by the, the big tooth is named for the, the edge of the leaf. It's larger than the, the quaking aspen. It's a real fine. Basswoods. And its cousin, the, uh, the linden. Birches, river birch, paper birch. There's also yellow birch. Ohio buckeye. There's not enough of those around. It's a nice tree. Again, a fairly good-sized uh, nut for the seed. Buckthorn is not one we want to plant. That's uh, one you want to stay away from. Invasive is a whole other topic I didn't get into either. Butternut's a cousin to the black walnut. So the, uh, the black walnut has a nice round golf ball nut. The butternut is more egg-shaped, a little bit uh, longer, oblong. Catalpas, that's one with the giant leaves, and it flowers later than everything else. It's got a nice big showy flower, but it comes out late when everything else is done flowering. And there's the bean pods. Uh, choke cherry. Cottonwoods. Uh, you know, people complain about the cotton. Well, it's it's a couple weeks out of the year. And then it's other than that, uh, you know, they, yeah, they're, they're, they're a messy tree. Well, a lot of trees drop something at some time of the year. I, I don't have anything against cottonwoods. And they have their place. There, there are Midwest redwoods. It's the biggest tree we're going to have around here. Crab apples, whole variety of different sizes and colors. Uh, they, they are susceptible to a, a common disease, uh, apple scab, so you want to watch and get a variety that's resistant to that. Elm is the one that's uh, subject to Dutch elm disease, but there are still lots of them around. Uh, the, the, the American elm has this light, dark, light, dark striping on the bark. So if you take a little piece of bark and break it open, you'll still confirm it by that. And then the Real sandpapery and rough, and and the uh, um, the shape of the the American elm is what what 
worked so well over street trees. It had a nice arching umbrella kind of shape, and to have a pair of those created the, the cathedral look on streets. Siberian uh, red elm is the one that does not have the, the uh, light and dark striping. And then Siberian elm is a much smaller leaf and, and uh, not quite as nice a tree usually. They're, I, I don't like using a weed tree, but they're, they're a common one that sprouts around in fence rows and things where you don't want them. Balsam firs, that's the one that smells the strongest. If you're buying your Christmas tree and you want the good smelling one, it's a balsam fir. And ginkgo is this one that uh, went through, it. they thought it was extinct. Uh, they only saw it in fossils and then found it in a, 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 a shrine uh, a, 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 in China. There was a, uh, what's it called? The, the monks live in a monastery in China. And that's and so all the ginkgos come from that small population that they, they rediscovered. The fruit is edible but stinky. Uh, some people like them. It's, it's what, apparently it's like that duran. It's a either you love it or hate it. Hackberry, uh, a fine tree, but it is known for low resistance to decay. So if it gets wounded when it's young, and then keeps growing, uh, you can almost count on it being hollowed out inside. So as long as it isn't wounded and it's a solid tree, they're fine. It also hosts a, a, a psyllid insect. These little bumps that form on the on the leaf of the hackberry are a, a tiny little bug that's so tiny it can fit through window screens. So you don't really want one right next to your house. Bitternut hickory and regular hickory and or shagbark. I believe, yeah, uh, there might be a third one, shagbark. Honey locusts. I like those. There aren't enough of those around. Some people don't. Ironwood is a fine, small tree. It's, a, it's one that doesn't get real big. Um, it's it's uh, very slow growing, so it's got really hard, dense wood, and uh, it's usually an indicator of really good soils. They, they grow in understory in, in oak forests. Again, not enough of those around. The Kentucky coffee tree, it's a great one. There's a, a stand of them in Como Park. Um, and they, they've started planting more of them around the, along the freeways. I've noticed quite a few. They'll have this, this fairly fat bean pod. So in the fall, after the leaves have dropped, and you'll, you'll notice that they have all the bean pods that are short and fat. The larch. That is a deciduous coniferous. So there is such a thing. Uh, the, the coniferous trees grow cones, and deciduous means they drop their leaves in the winter. So it is a, a tree that, that does have cones, but goes dormant and, and bare like all the rest of the broadleaf trees in the fall. And then it, it, it comes back and in, in the fall it, it turns yellow first, so they're really pretty at that, for that little period. Japanese tree lilac, another real small one. If you're looking at putting something under a power line, that's one that will fit. It'll only grow to 20 some feet high. This is the, the cousin to the basswood is the little leaf linden. This is the one that has a real distinct uh, crown, so it'll, it'll be a, like a solid gumdrop only it's a favorite of the Japanese beetles. So these years now, that as the Japanese beetle population gets worse, they they get chewed on pretty hard. Black locust. That's what that one does have thorns. The honey locust, the thorns something that does not. This one, nasty thorns. Uh, you, you don't necessarily want that as a yard tree. They're they're beautiful smelling and uh, they are a nitrogen fixer. The, they were promoted for restoring old mines and things because they are in the legume family. So like the beans, they, they, they add nitrogen to the soil. But uh, watch out for the thorn. Amur maple, another smaller one. It's, uh, it was widely planted by the, the um, DOT, the Department of Transportation, along freeways and different places. But they've since realized it's a little more invasive than they thought. And it's, it's spreading more than they want. So it's no longer planted. Box elder, it's our compound leaf maple. And uh, if you're out in North Dakota and it's the only tree you got, it's going to be a fine tree. It's just we've got some better options uh, around than uh, oaks and maples and things. But box elders are okay too. They, other than the, the, they host the box elder bug, so it's the female trees that produce the seeds that are a host. And, and 
Freeman maple is a cross between a, a, a red and a silver maple. And then Norway is the one maple that has a white, milky sap in it. So if you, uh, if you break open the leaf, you'll, you'll see that uh, identified as maples, the, the Norway. Red maples, native. And that's a nice tree. Silver maples. Any of the maples will uh, allow you to make maple syrup from their sap. It's just that the sugar maple has the highest sugar content, so you don't have to boil as much. With the sugar maple, it's 40 or 50 gallons to one, and then with the others, it's like 70 or 80. Mountain ash, it's not an ash tree, so the Emerald Ash Board is not going to eat it. But the berries are uh, very valuable to birds. And the red oaks, we've got acorns. We've got the pointy leaves are the red oak family, red and pins. The rounded leaves are the white oak family, so the birds and white oaks have, have rounded edges, not sharp points. And oaks are my favorite, really. Uh, then Russian olive is one that's kind of a junkyard dog type of tree. It, uh, again, it's good in rough conditions and places where it's a challenging environment. They, they aren't necessarily a very pretty tree when they get big, but they have their place. Service berry is more of a big bush. Uh, you can prune it to be a tree. It's an edible berry, real nice, also called Juneberry. And then the willows. So you've got uh, the, there's a well 300 different willow shrub species in Minnesota, and and just uh, one or two tree species that actually get up big enough to call them a tree. So and then pines. So we've got pines and spruces. Norway. The, the pines have longer needles and individual and clusters. The spruces have Shorter needles and individuals. Norway has the longest cones, and they hang down like they can be almost a foot long sometimes. White cedar, uh, that's a real popular in cemeteries for some reason. All right, the last uh, thing here: environmental quiz. Oh, it's not, it's not supposed to show the answers right away, dude. <laughs> Population of the U.S., if, if that's the case, you're going to see the answers each time here. Uh, it's, it's currently 300 million. Let's see if the next one works right. Oh, it's showing the answers. Oh, and it's jumping ahead. Wow, this isn't anything of mine. What's up, Damien? Yeah, that's too bad. It's uh, I was supposed to give you the chance to, to guess the answer before I... I Highlight it. It's a bit, so the animation feature isn't working. All right. Um, we'll just blow through them anyways. Population of the world, 1950. Oh, I didn't do that. Go back. 7.4 billion in the world. Let's see, do I got to slow down or... Estimated world population in 2050 will be about 9.7 billion. Am I even controlling this, or are you advancing them for me? Seems weird. It's it's either not responding or jumping ahead. It almost acts like. All right, population of the world is currently increasing at 9,000 people per hour. Not necessarily a bad thing if we can feed them all, get the food to them. Consumption of mineral resources is growing. U.S. consumption of, of building materials, which one's the greatest? Of steel, aluminum, wood, plastic, and cement? It is wood by volume. Uh, just the, the facts on the wood consumptions, numbers there. Globally, forests are disappearing, but not in the U.S. So in, in other countries, the forests are being cut down and converted to something else. Uh, but in the U.S., the, the forests are being managed and, and um, being used for forests again when they, when they harvest. 
So the clearing of lands for ag use is the primary cause of deforestation in other countries. Monoberia covered by forests now compared to 1600 when the pilgrims first arrived is at 73%. And, and most of that drop from 100% in 1600 to was, was in the, the first you know, 100 years. And, and since then, it's been very stable. We're not losing forest lately. Forest covered 70% of land. That's a, another graphic of, of that number. It's, it's less, but it isn't disappearing as bad. So there's the, the drop off in a year. So 1600 to 1900 was when the only loss occurred in forest land. So trees do uh, capture carbon dioxide and release oxygen. That's where wood comes from. My battery is failing. Up there, no, well, my remote's over there. Doesn't matter what point, I don't think. Um, yeah, uh, so there's no evidence that, that any species have ever gone extinct because of logging activity, specifically. I think we're done. Oh. Yeah. Well, whatever that was. So uh, what is, it, you know, it, the big thing is solar energy panels right now. And uh, it's, you know, wood and trees naturally are, are solar collectors. So we don't have to uh, look to only to, to mechanized ways of capturing solar energy. Trees can do that for us as well. And I it's up a little flaky here, but I am close to done. Um, questions? Get some lights on. Maybe it had other defects if it would. So, yeah, evidence of for well, if, if it's if the foliage is two thirds to three quarters of what it should have, if it hasn't declined beyond that, it's, it should still be an option. Um, yeah, once once the tree is, is an ash tree has lost enough foliage that it's losing leaves uh, significantly, then it's not going to absorb the chemical anymore either. So you, at that point, it's a goner. The insecticide does go in and, and, and flow throughout the tree, and then if the beetles come along and, and uh, try and eat the tree, they're going to die from the insecticide that's in there, and it's good for a couple of years. So it's, a, it's a systemic. It's inside the tree. It's not sprayed on it. It's injected into it. Question? Yeah, yeah, there's a right of way from the the curb isn't the, the limit of the city property. It's actually you got a, you know another 10 feet quite often for the sidewalk and the and the boulevard trees belong to the city. So they manage those. Well, uh, some cities handle it differently. Typically it should be the, the the city should be dealing with them. A lot of homeowners Get possessive about the boulevard tree, and it's it's theirs until there's a problem with it. And then it, now it's yours. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, if it's if it's at all a, a, a obvious hazard or a risk of some kind, the city should be getting those out of there. That's a safety issue.
it was so it wasn't a, a boulevard tree. It was on a neighboring property. It fell on your structure. So yeah, they're, they're one of the. Uh, anybody can plant anything that's little when you plant it, and then time goes on, and they grow. So that you, you can't stop somebody from planting a tree 100 years ago, and trees will grow into other people's property. They'll, they'll, the roots will lift the driveway or the branches. So the, the law, there's a whole other category or talk on, on legal issues in, in between neighbors. It's often the case. You have a right to enjoy your property and if, if a neighbor's tree is interfering with that, you have a right to prune and remove anything crossing the property boundary without undue damage to the tree. So, uh, well, if it goes to court, the judge might ask, did you talk to your neighbor about it? You know, did you offer to help? Uh, did you work it out? That, that can come up, that you know, you've initiated some kind of negotiating. But... Um, the thing is, you can't unduly harm a tree, so you, you, you can't trespass to do a cut. And if it's supposed the roots were lifting the driveway right at the property line, and, and you bring in a trencher and you dig a big three-foot deep trench, and you, the tree dies. Now you've, you've, you've gone beyond addressing the nuisance of, of those roots bothering your driveway. You could have done it with a, a you know, couple of roots here and there and, instead of killing the tree off. So there, there's, there's limits. It's, it, tree law is a whole other talk. <laughs> Sorry? I it's it's not so much uh, overpopulation as as a poor distribution of resources. You know, that there's uh, so much food is wasted in the world right now. Uh, the, the numbers on that are, are horrible, that, that all the food that we waste, and if it was properly distributed, people wouldn't be going hungry. Well, that's that's um, yeah. The, they had some pretty strict enforcement in the past. I've heard that it's less now. That they they aren't as strict about enforcing one-child policies. And there, there's incentives and disincentives. Our own U.S. tax codes can be an incentive to have more kids or not. You know, um, how much subsidy is there for schools? Is a but um, I don't know that. Again, it's it's a Fair distribution is, is a big part of it. You know, we we consume so much more per person in energy and resources in wealthy countries than they do in the poor countries. So we've we've gone through our, our industrial stage and, and uh, we polluted like crazy and we cut down all our forests and and then things changed in the economy. Now other countries are going to be denied that opportunity. Should we say that China can't build coal powered plants to have electricity? You know it's it's. Uh, they, they have a right to, to develop as we develop, but we should be smarter about it. You know, they, they should have other options that we didn't know about when, when we went through the same phase of development. It's consumable, sure. Yeah, nobody's going to spend money on treating a sick tree. It's firewood. Yeah. Yeah. As population grows, the forests shrink. Um, so again, the technology can help. It's
that's where there were you know you can bring in solar powered lights and and uh, solar ovens and things there's technology that would help alleviate having to cut down the trees just to burn them uh, and and that's where again the you know the fairness uh, needs to be looked at in a broader sense you got a question Right. Well, it's it's uh, the the one of the root causes is the climate change that the winters aren't as cold as they were. We're yeah, all throughout the Rockies, there's that issue. The bark beetles used to get killed off by. 35, 40 below temperatures, and now if it doesn't get that cold, it only gets to 25 or 30, more of them survive. Um, we don't have killer bees or some other nasty insects from the south here in Minnesota because it gets cold enough. Uh, the, the emerald ash borer has not exploded in population as bad as other places because it gets cold enough. Uh, they're not gonna, it's not going to stop them completely, but it, this last winter, they, they got numbers on it. It, it got down to 35 degrees, a little bit further north in Minnesota, when it was that cold for a long enough time, for a few days, 90% of the beetles got killed. It little, you come a little further south, mid part of the state, it was got to 35 below, but only for a day or two. There, it was a, like 80% got killed. And then here in the Twin Cities, it, it, it hit 25 or almost 30 below briefly, and 60% got killed. So there's 40% surviving. They're going to still come back to haunt us. But... Those kind of things affect the population, along with the, the forest changing in time. As it, as it grows and gets older and the trees are crowded, they get weaker, they don't have the same resources, they become susceptible to beetles. So the, the, the age of the forest and the makeup of the species are, are all factors, too. So I got some... Uh, and I, because we couldn't quite run the uh, the quiz as I intended, um, I, had, I was going to, you know, whoever got an, to answer a, a question was going to get a calendar. I'm just going to hand them out. Now, unfortunately, the year is, is half over. So, uh, you know, we've got six uh, months to go still. You can have a nice, this is sponsored by uh, my company, if you want one. And... Uh, so Davy Tree sponsors this national champion tree uh, database and, and uh, just a bunch of pretty tree pictures in there. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh huh. I'd be patient. You know, how big is it now? It's just little. I assume. It's Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. trees need to mature. Uh, like people, they're on their own time scale, and you might not see fruit for some years yet. So. Yeah. My dad had a, a cherry tree that um, it, it did well for some years, but what they do with, with a lot of landscape trees that you buy is it's grafted. And they do that on purpose. So they vegetatively take a little piece of the of the tree that you like and and graft it onto a rootstock that'll that'll support it better than the other. But that way they keep a real consistent crown shape. They know that you know what's the picture in the catalog is going to look like the tree that when it grows up. Unfortunately, on this one, the 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 rootstock wasn't it matured at a smaller size than the crown. So it was at the right at the base. You could see where the, it stayed. You know that big, but the, the tree kept growing and it outgrew the root.
So that, yeah, yeah, girdling in the winter time could be an issue. With the, again, they're going after that cambium layer where all the nutrients are. Well, there's a little snack downstairs, but let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that uh, your your gifts of, of trees be something that we can open our eyes to see and appreciate. We thank you that, that we have them to provide us with so many different things and give us a place to, to grow. And We ask that uh, in Jesus' name we be able to continue to be stewards of your creation. Thank you, God. Amen.